Hi, I'm Ken Mann with Equity Partners HG. Today I'm with Derek Abbott, a partner in the bankruptcy group of the Wilmington law firm Morris, Nichols, Arsht, and Tunnel. We're going to talk today about how professionals in bankruptcy cases can make sure they get paid, and how to avoid uh, administratively insolvent cases, and when you find yourself in those cases, what you can do to protect your interest. Thanks for being here today, Derek. Glad to be here, Ken. Appreciate the opportunity. I guess the first question is, how do you avoid landing yourself in an administratively insolvent case? It all starts at the beginning with the engagement letter. And uh, the most important thing to do, particularly if you're representing a debtor, uh, is to make sure that you have an engagement letter that calls for a nice, healthy retainer. And uh, the important thing to remember is that um, because you are ultimately likely to be involved in a court proceeding, you got to make sure that retainer is big enough to carry you at least 45 to 60 days once the case has started because it's going to be that long before you're going to be able to get the court uh, to authorize any payment to you. So I guess it's a pretty good sign that the debtor isn't going to be able to survive a bankruptcy case if they can't pay that type of retainer. I, I think that's right. And most, uh, obviously there's a, there's a wide spectrum of cases. Um, but in most of the cases, the lenders are going to be in there and they are sophisticated enough to know that if they want good, healthy representation and to give the bankruptcy case a chance, they're going to have to pay professionals. And usually that starts with their a willingness to fund a, a retainer of some sort. So in a smaller bankruptcy case, is it typical that there would be some type of carve out to protect uh, administrative claimants that the secured creditor agrees to? There are, although it's, it's usually a, a little bit narrower set that they would establish that sort of a carve out with. Initially, you have attention. When you ask for the retainer, what they're going to want to say is, well, I'm going to pay you less up front, but I'm going to give you a carve out of proceeds from my collateral that should protect you. And you got to be a little careful there because there have to be proceeds from collateral for that really to work out very well. But they do typically, once they've got folks on board, you see two kinds of carve outs. One, uh, is really designed to pay the expenses of the professionals involved in the case. And usually that's not just the debtor's counsel, but it also would be a creditor's committee counsel uh, and also uh, the fees of the United States trustee, which is the you know, Department of Justice watchdog organization that manages uh, the cases and takes statutory fees from all debtors. They often also try to negotiate, uh, you'll see in carve outs these days, what people perhaps um, unfortunately label sometimes a burial expense carve out, where if it's a case that might have a sale proceeding, uh, once that's all done, then there'll be a basket of $50,000, $100,000 $100, that's intended for the professionals to just wind down the case and get it done. Often these days, unfortunately, that winds up being a dismissal uh, sometimes of the case because um, it, it's harder and harder to get folks to agree to fund a plan. Is there any diligence that you do as an attorney with respect to the financial picture of a debtor? I like to look at the financial picture when I first get in the case. Obviously, I want to make sure that I've protected myself with a retainer. But once you get in, you do need to understand um, what the capital structure looks like, of course. Um, the tricky thing is understanding, uh, particularly in a case where there's multiple tranches of debt, how those intercreditor uh, relationships work because um, you know sometimes you'll start with a retainer from the bank who's at the top and before long uh, a couple things happen either they trade out of that credit and you're dealing with a new bank or uh, there's some liquid uh, asset uh, monetization that occurs that causes the first lien lenders to get paid off and now you're you're left in a case with the second lien lenders and you got to make sure that you've got an arrangement that works at sort of both levels of debt that way. Derek, are there certain industries or types of cases um, where maybe the value isn't very clear up front, where you have to be particularly careful about uh, thinking that there's collateral value to get paid from later and then finding out um, that maybe the debtor was overly optimistic about the value of a certain asset class or about the prospects of the business? You know, Ken, that's, a, that's an awfully good question. There are, uh, there are lots of cases where uh, the asset classes are unique or, or different, and sometimes um, the assumptions that people have about the value of those assets 
uh, varies wildly during the case, um, in, in good and bad ways. Uh, sometimes you go into a case where it may have, uh, well, I, I can think of a recent case I was involved in where we had an enormous number of patents uh, that were available. People thought they had a particular value. Turned out we went to an auction and they were wildly undervalued and, and the auction turned out to be a great result. But the same thing can happen uh, in, in the opposite direction and it's those other cases that you have to be a little more, a little more careful about. Uh, particularly as you get into the smaller cases, uh, it, it absolutely can be a serious problem if people haven't done an adequate market test uh, to really get a sense of, of what the asset values are. Is there anything in particular that you can do once you realize a case is going to be administratively insolvent? What I mean is you're already involved in the case, you represent, say, the debtor, and uh, you're two months in, and now it becomes clear the case is at risk of being administratively insolvent or is administratively insolvent. Are there any steps you can take? Uh, well, it's funny. You, you remind me of a, of a case that I had a similar situation. We uh, were representing a small debtor. We went in with a, with a pretty standard uh, debtor in possession financing package. The company had not adequately forecast uh, 503B9 claims, administrative claims for goods delivered immediately prior to the case. And we got into the case and shortly figured out that the budget was going to be inadequate for us to actually be able to pay those claims get the case done, get a sale accomplished like we hoped. Um, we put on a case in front of the court trying to establish the likelihood of recoveries on preference actions as a means to be able to pay those 503B9s. Um, the judge did one of these, kind of looked down his nose at us um, and suggested that we go back out in the hall and come up with another method. Um, but fortunately, because we were in the case for a month already by the time this happened, um, the bank was pregnant, so to speak. And so they needed to figure out a way to, to, to make sure that the case wasn't going to be dismissed for being administratively insolvent because they really needed the case as a vehicle to liquidate their collateral. So ultimately what they did was negotiate a sliding scale where the more uh, proceeds we got, the, the, the greater portion of the proceeds they would carve out to pay these other administrative creditors. Uh, so there are some tools you can use. The, the most important one is having... Um, a creditor constituency that really needs the bankruptcy process. At least in Delaware and many other courts that I've been in, it seems that uh, the courts are reluctant to approve sales or uh, other things if the administrative claims aren't going to be paid. Is, is that fairly safe to assume that in Delaware a judge isn't going to approve a sale without the administrative claimants getting paid? Not a hard and fast rule, but certainly every judge's preference is to make sure that all the administrative claims are paid. Um, nobody likes to run an administratively insolvent case, and uh, least of all the United States trustee doesn't want to allow uh, an administratively insolvent case. So I've always found that if we're getting close to that edge, um, early disclosure and often disclosure uh, is the best policy. And you don't want to surprise a judge uh, to get halfway down the road and then let them know that administrative creditors aren't going to be paid. It's not good for lawyers getting paid either because the professional fees, of course, are peri passu with, with all those administrative creditors as well. So um, folks are pretty careful uh, about trying to make sure that they're not running into administrative insolvencies. Great. Well, helpful advice. I know you and I are all for the professionals in the cases getting paid. So, also uh, early and often. Early and often, and uh, we appreciate the tips. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Ken. Appreciate it.